Thanks, Jeremy. I was very excited when you asked me here because I'd had excellent feedback from the meeting in Boston, and I'm, I'm sure that today will be just as good and closer to home, which is also nice. So I'm just going to give a bit of a, a, a flavour of some of the things that more investigative projects that we are doing at Roche at the moment. Um, and I think it helps if we start off with where we can actually influence immunogenicity because there are a number of risk factors which, which Tim went through and there are some that we actually have um, the potential to, to change a little bit and others that we, you know, we really have no potential to change at all so we can't do anything about the patient background. Um, we can do very little about the dosing schedule and the route. You know, there's a, okay, we can decide to give everything IV or as an infusion, but really we want to be able to develop medicines that we can give um, sub-Q or, or inhaled or something like that. There's a strong business case for us to do that. So with this thing, you know, we, we can't influence that very much. Where we can influence immunogenicity is with the, the primary sequence to a certain extent because I think we always have to worry more about potency and stability and things like that rather than... than immunogenicity which may or may not have a consequence when it goes into the clinics. The purity is a place where we have a lot of influence and the formulation we can have an influence as well. I think some formulate, um, we, we spend a lot of time getting rid of aggregates. Um, that's a place where we can have an impact but I think we also need to understand how important these things are and actually when aggregates become an issue, if indeed they do, you know, if indeed they really are an issue for immunogenicity. So these are really the areas I think that we have to focus on. So I have a more simplified version than Tim of how to make an ARDA response. It's uh, more complicated than a black box but less, less complicated than his version. And I think I don't really need to go through that with this audience. But what I do want to pay, make it, um, use this to show you is the places where we can impact, uh, where we can look for an immune response. So firstly, there's MHC, MHC class 2. So we can look to see whether a peptide potentially could bind an MHC class 2 and also whether it does bind to MHC class 2. And secondly, we can look at a more kind of biological level, whether we get activation of T helper cells and indeed whether we get anti-drug antibodies. So if we look at the different methods which are currently out there, sort of pretty much developed, we start off with our in silico and MHC binding where we just look specifically whether a potential peptide will bind or not into an MHC groove. We can then go one step further, um, which pro-immune immune do, and we also do, um, to look to see whether a protein is taken up, processed, and presented by MHC class 2 on the cell surface. So this will go one step further and actually see not only does a peptide potentially bind into the groove, but actually whether it can be taken up and presented um, and here we can look a little bit different at what formulations may, may have, not just your primary sequence. So we've been doing some work recently on this MAPS, which is the detection of MHC peptides. And basically what we do is we take our mature dendritic cells, we immunoprecipitate MHC class 2 in the peptide, we elite those peptides, and then we use um, LCMS to determine what those potential or what those sequences are. So here we're going one step further to see which peptides are presented by MHC class 2. So for this to be useful to us, I think we have to look at what requirements we need from the system. So we need to make sure that it's reproducible. We know that we're sort of at the edge of what um, mass spec can, can really detect with this. So we need to make sure that we're seeing the same peptides reproducibly presented by um, MHC. We need to make sure that we can use a, a relatively small amount of API. I mean, this kind of process will only ever be useful in a ranking system, so it really needs to be done 
at your lead identification and, and optimization stage where you're really ranking your compounds based on which molecule is least likely or has less risk factors for immunogenicity. And it also needs to be quite quick or else, again, at that, at that stage, in our company at least, um, people are un, unwanted. Well, they're not, not really wanting to delay their timelines based on a study which, which may or may not help you in the future, basically. Biologically, we need to know whether this is better prediction than your in silico models, because in silico we can do in a half a day, whereas this will take a number of weeks. We need to make sure that we identify the same epitopes that you would see in a memory T cell response. Um, so this, again, is something where we have quite a lot of um, pushback from our company. They really want to see the proof. You know, the proof is, are we identifying the same epitopes which are able to drive memory T cell responses in exposed patients? And we need to make sure that we can, we can cover a representative um, amount of the HLA repertoire. So we've been working on a, on a model antigen, and for this we've gone into the um, allergy field. Just because um, there's a lot of literature out there, there's a, there are a lot of groups who have um, identified what are the memory T cell responses, and so they've sort of done a lot of the hard work for us. So first of all, we, we, we needed to check really that, that we are reproducibly seeing the same um, peptides presented by different, well, in, the, in this assay. So here we've got three different donors which have been, um, which have been used to do the MAPS analysis on. Uh, in the first one, we've, we've reproduced it three times or four times, and you see that we reproducibly see the same peptides presented in each time for all three of these donors. So we're quite confident, well, I mean, we're very confident now that we are detecting all of the peptides that have been presented um, on these, by these uh, patients, or the, sorry, their donors by their MHC class 2. And so then we, we look, and here we've got, I think, about 15 donors, and we've looked using the BETV1A again at all of the different potential epitopes that we see. And here at the bottom, I've compared it to our tepitope, which is an in silico tool. And you see here, we have one epitope here with tepitope that we haven't, haven't de uh, sorry, that we haven't detected with maps. These other ones in the middle we have. Um, here, I think, again, we have another epitope, which we, or potential epitope that you see with tepitope that we haven't seen. And if you look in here, um, we see one where we, we don't see it with, with tepitope. If we then make the comparison to what we've seen in the literature, so here we have five different publications which have used patients who are allergic to birch tree allergen, and they've done memory T cell responses on blood from these patients. And you see that we have seven different um, epitope areas that were detected by this. And we make the comparison to what we detected with, with the, the maps. We see that we detect, have detected six out of seven of these epitopes. It's interesting here that Tepitope, our in silico tool, actually identified this as a potential epitope. In this area where Tepitope did um, detect a potential epitope, um, there has never been one found in, in these responses. So I think it's really important that we actually feedback with all of these technologies that we develop. And we really look in the clinics and, and we devise ways to look clinically whether these assays are really relevant or are they not. And this is actually quite a hard task because we're never going to make two biologics, a immunogenic one and one which has been de-risked. And we're never going to do a side-by-side -side comparison. So we, I, think, I think it's very important that we do feedback these results but we need to devise ways that we can actually do it. So we've also been, um, oh, sorry. So when you look at, at maps in general, I think we see that 
we may see false positives because you may see tolerance at the T cell or the B cell level. And I think we have to be aware of that with any kind of assay which detects a potential T cell epitope. In a way, there's no way around it. We may see false negatives here, which may be due to technical reasons. Um, we don't know, and I, I don't know if ProImmune has done studies on this, how well this kind of assay works when you have glycosylation or um, you, know, you have something which is attached to the peptide. I don't know if, if you can comment. I'd be very interested to hear later on. The pros are that you're mimicking not only just binding, you're looking to see whether something is processed and presented in vivo. You can use it to look at different formulations because I think there will be a difference between whether something is presented under, under some kind of circumstances and not under others. And of course, we can look at a representative HLA repertoire. So we've also been looking at whether, you know, talking to other people within Roche to see whether some of the assays that we do can have applications in slightly different fields. And what I'm going to show you now is, is some very preliminary work that we've done with some of our um, DMPK colleagues. And what we've looked at here is um, potential T cell epitopes with uh, immune mediated drug induced liver injury. So when we look at idiosyncratic drug um, induced liver injury, it accounts for 13% of your, your liver injury in the US. And it, indeed, it's one of the, well, it is the major reason why you'll get withdrawal of drugs from the market. There are a number of different. Oh, yeah, sorry. There are a number of different mechanisms, or potential mechanisms. I mean, I think basically we don't know what the mechanisms are here, and a number have been suggested. So there's the Hapton hypothesis, where you have a reactive metabolite which will bind to your a, a internal protein, an endogenous protein in the liver, and create a neoepitope. Uh, you have the danger hypothesis where these reactive metabolites may induce a little bit of, of death or something. You may get a um, danger signal, and so you may get different uptake and processing of endogenous uh, proteins. There's also a pharmacological interaction hypothesis whereby you, they may directly activate T cells. But, I mean, this is something I won't talk about today because it's, it's not going to be relevant for MAPS. So we asked the question of, can we use this to identify um, common neoepitopes? So we did a very basic thing here. So we took some drugs, um, some internal drugs and some external drugs which are known to induce reactive metabolites or drug-induced liver injury. We incubated this with um, human liver microsomes. And then after 24 hours, we co-incubated them with our dendritic cells, then did our usual MAPS analysis where we, where we immunoprecipitated the uh, MHC peptide and looked on our mass spec to see what we saw. So these very first experiments, and I do want to make this clear that this is very preliminary, we found newly identified uh, peptides which were presented, and by that I mean that they weren't detected in our control samples. You need to note that the setup that we use doesn't allow for the detection of covalently modified peptides, but we see no reason that if you know what your um, your common reactive metabolites are, which you usually do, then you could um, put that into your program so that you also can detect uh, covalently modified peptides. And we also found that they were able to drive T cell responses in some donors. And i just give you an example here where we identified this peptide X where our, our donor was 0404-0107. When we then synthesized this peptide and used it to, um, to induce a T cell response, unfortunately we couldn't do it in the same, in the same donor, but when we used it, a, a donor with an 0701 and 1301, we found an, our, our peptide was able to drive, an immune response, drive a T cell response. If we look at our tepitope prediction, we see that um, 0701, we should get a hit, 
and with the other two haplotypes we don't. So for us, this sort of all fits. It's all very early days. But I think it is something that we should think about. You know, we're developing a lot of assays, and I think there are other instances, not just immunogenicity. And I mean, in a way, this is an immunogenicity issue, but we should be looking at how they can be used um, in slightly different situations. And I mean, here, often with, with Dili, they think that it's the same proteins, which may be a problem. I mean, you usually get similar reactive metabolites. And so maybe in the future we could use it as some sort of screening tool. Okay, so now I'm just going to take a, a slightly different tact and move on to our, our sort of later on down the development of, of an immune response and look at humanized animals. And I think that there are three different types of humanized animals that are, are mostly used. There's the HLA transgenics. There's a, here I have a human IgG transgenic because I'm looking from a very Roche perspective and we make monoclonal antibodies. We don't really make a lot of, of um, cytokines and things like that. And then we have the fully human immune system, which, which Tim touched on before. So I'm going to talk really about some human IgG transgenics. So the real question is, um, can we make the mouse more like the human? Our, when we look at our regulatory guidance, it always tells us that non-clinical animal studies are not relevant in the prediction of immunogenicity. The reasons being that we have different HLA specificities between mice and men. Um, and then there's the issue that a human protein is always going to be foreign to the mouse. All of our tolerance mechanisms are to the, the murine rather than to human proteins. So we need to look at ways that we can circumvent this issue. And if we look in the literature, there are a number of different human IgG transgenic mice models which are out there. I don't know if anybody is working on any of them from here. No? Okay. So first of all, we have, we have two very similar models, actually, where we have murine IgG knockouts, which are then crossed with transgenic human IgG mice, and here we, we get the five feature mice. So these are tolerant to human anti antibody. They undergo um, heavy lambda and kappa rearrangements and should have a, a wide repertoire of, of antibodies which have been produced. They can undergo class switching. They undergo somatic hypermutation. The issue with this particular one is that the response, so the immune response, the B cell response, is human in terms of it's a human B cell receptor on your B cell, and your human B cell receptor will not couple that well to the murine signaling molecules which are needed to transmit your, uh, your signals. So you don't get a very good immune response in these mice. So there is a, another model which pe people are using which has a very similar um, murine IgG knockout crossed with a, a human, here, here it's an IgG2 mouse. So you have this, this mouse which is, in, a, in terms, quite similar. But if you then cross this to a wild-type mouse, you can have a het mouse where, again, it, you get tolerance to your human antibody. You get rearrangement in a normal repertoire. You get class switching. Somatic hypermutation is expected. I don't know whether, um, whether they see it or not. The response is mostly murine. And I mean, here, when you look at your surface um, B cell receptor, it's more than 95% murine. There's very little human. And I think the issue here is probably that when you get your murine B cell receptor rearranged, you'll get your allelic exclusion, and probably your human is not that well rearranged because your human will not signal very well, whereas your murine will signal well. I think both of these models are not ideal. Nevertheless, I think they were very, they're very good ideas because you know, basically these, these mice were made not to look at immunogenicity of, of human drugs. They were, looked to, they were made to actually make fully human antibodies as drugs. So it's been a very good idea to take these animals and use them for this, for this role without actually having the, the expense of, and time required to make a new antibody. 
So we have a group, we have a very nice, trans well, we had a very nice transgenic animal group in Roche, and it was very good too because the, the person who ran it had quite an immunology background. So he was very interested in this. And he's now made a human IgG1 mouse. It's tolerant to human IgG1 only. You get rearrangements. It's a mini repertoire. So you get a number of different IgG molecules. It's not the whole repertoire. We expect you get somatic hypermutation, but we don't know. Your immune response is murine only. So I think what's nice about this model is that your human B cell, um, your human IgG is soluble only. You do not get human IgG acting as a B cell receptor. So by that, you have tolerance to your human IgG, but it doesn't get in the way of your murine immune response and your, your murine B cell <coughs> response. So what we're doing here is really looking at this, using this to look at the role of aggregates in immunogenicity. So the idea is that when you have a naive IgG, you put it into a wild-type mouse, you get an immune response. If you put a native IgG into our, into our transgenic mouse, you get no immune response. If you have an aggregated IgG, put this into our mouse, the question is, what kind of immune response do we get? And this work is ongoing, but I'm just going to show you one slide here to show you that we do actually get tolerance to our human IgG. You see in the grey, this is the response to um, in naive mice, and we have three different transgenic lines where you see we have tolerance. Interestingly, not just IgG1, but also to IgG2, 3, and 4. So by putting that human IgG1 in there, we're actually getting, seeing tolerance to different, um, to different um, IgG, not just IgG1. So we now are, are using this to look at different kinds of aggregates, whether you have dimers or multimers, what kind of effect that has in, immunogen in immunogenicity. And I imagine that this will be published sort of sometime around the end of the year. So now I just want to, to sum up a little bit of some of the things that, that we're looking at, at and, and what I think we should be doing. I think what is really important, and I, I don't know about you, but I, I work in quite a, a cynical company, well, a, a company where there's lots of different opinions. If you look at the Roche group as a whole, we have, we have one um, sort of sister company which, which does a lot in terms of preclinical immunogenicity de-risking. We have another company within the Roche group which does very little. And I think what, we, what is really lacking in this field is feeding back from the clinics that, that these assays really do have an impact. So if we look sort of in the early lead optimization stage, we have all of these prediction and silico um, in vitro models that we can use. We have the um, EIH enabling studies where we look in animals. The question is whether... Um, the impact of immunogenicity, whether that has any impact on, on what you would see in man. I mean, I think a big question for us, and I'm looking forward to the next talk, is hypersensitivity reactions at this stage. If you have ardors in the clinics and you see types of hypersensitivity reactions in the animals, do we expect to see it in man if you see that? You know, what kind of impact is there regardless of making ardors or not? Are the consequences of others the same? I think what's very important is that we feed back from what we see in the clinic back to our in silico models to constantly see, are they working? Is this one better than another one? You know, how should we be using them in the future? And I think I'm not sure who's involved in the, um, the, the European... I, IMI initiative, I think that sort of initiative where we get everybody together from clinics, preclinical to clinics, and look at these. And then finally, I think we can't just rely, at the moment at least, on just one kind of assay. We need to feed them all in together. And I won't say that Roche is doing this. I would say that some, some parts of Roche are doing this kind of thing where you, you, know, you have your ca candidates... You use your in silico tools to take three or four different candidates, 
do these in vitro and, um, assays and feedback into the candidates. And then when you have your lead candidate, do you do the kind of in vivo um, assays to see what of impact your formulation and things like that have? I think we have a whole toolbox and we need to use them together at the moment and then take a view to see in the future how they work. So there are lots of people to thank here. I mean, this is a, we have a very nice collaboration with our, our sister company in Chugai, where we sort of joined forces to, to look at immunogenicity. And I won't go through everybody here, um, but a lot of thank yous.